my name is Mr. Dowling. Maybe for some of you, this is not your first time joining me. Maybe some of you joined me for my paper one video. If you did join me for my paper one video, you'll see that I still haven't cleaned up behind me and I'm actually still wearing the same shirt. But hey ho, uh, today I want to talk to you about paper two, which is really exciting. Um, let's crack on. Um, there's going to be quite a lot of overlap here with the paper one video, but there are some key differences that you need to look out for. Uh, also, bear in mind that you can probably do a bit more in preparation for paper two than paper one. So some of the advice I have for you today is um, what you can do before the exam, uh, not just what you can do in the exam itself. Um, anyway, criterion A, knowledge and understanding. Um, here I have four points for you, uh, four things I want you to remember. First of all, make sure you know your text. Uh, secondly, please make sure that you are familiar with the key points of those texts, if nothing else. Third, try and remember some quotes. I'll talk about that a little bit more later because it is controversial. Um, and the fourth point is include advanced ideas. Let's find out more about all of those things. First of all, and I can't stress enough how important this is, you need to know your chosen text inside out. You need to know everything that there is to know about those texts because ultimately you need to write about them in detail. In addition, for Criterion A, you are being assessed on your knowledge and understanding of the chosen works. If you have not read the works, you're not going to be able to have any knowledge about them, you're not going to be able to understand them. Thankfully, you should have read the text in class, which is brilliant because as you have read, you've no doubt had lots of fantastic instruction from your teacher and discussion with your classmates. But I think we need to go further than that. You can't be going into the exam having read the book just once. I would strongly encourage you to go away and read it by yourself after you've read it as a class. You might even want to watch a film version, but be careful because the film could well be quite different from the actual book. And remember, we're always talking about the book, not the film. Um, and there are lots of study guides available for the books that you have read. Um, there might even be revision websites. Go away, read those and make sure you know everything there is to know about the text. Okay, maybe everything I have just said is a bit unrealistic. Maybe we can't remember everything that um, you can know about the text. Maybe there are going to be some details that we forget about. That's understandable, I suppose. Um, what we can do, however, is make sure we are familiar with all of the key points of the text. And by this, I'm referring to things like characters, who are the main characters, who are secondary characters. Um, what are the settings? Maybe there's one particular setting, but maybe there are various settings throughout the book. Um, what is the overall plot? What happens? Um, and what are the key themes, the key messages? We should be able to remember all of those things. Um, we should 
try and remember some quotes as well. This might be a slightly controversial point because there is no requirement for you to actually know quotes. Um, and the IB will tell you that it's not a necessity. But I do think that by including quotes, you can demonstrate your knowledge and understanding in a way that is easier than not knowing the quotes. Now, I'm not asking you to go away and remember and then regurgitate really long quotes. Let's just think of the main ones, the short, the snappy ones. For example, if you are reading The Catcher in the Rye, Holden Caulfield always uses the word phony to describe things. Now, there's no reason why you can't remember the word phony. In The Great Gatsby, there's a famous quote from Nick Calloway. I was within and without, simultaneously enchanted and repelled by the inexhaustible variety of life. Maybe we don't need to remember the whole thing, but we could certainly remember within and without. And we could make some valid points about that or use those quotes to support some other things that we are saying in our essay. And the last thing I want to say about Criterion A is um, about advanced ideas. When it comes to literature, one way of including advanced ideas is by referring to literary theory. Now, you might have discussed some literary theories with your teacher. The IB has produced some of their own resources about literary theories. Um, you could go into a lot of depth about literary theories. For the purposes of the IB Paper 2 exam, I don't think you need to go into too much depth and you don't need to know about every single theory. But just think about things like Marxism, feminism, psychoanalysis. And if there are ways to integrate these advanced ideas into your overall work, that would be uh, an example of you including some advanced ideas that show some great understanding and insight of the text in question. Um, so that is always uh, something you could go away and find out more about at this stage if you don't know about these things already. Have you been paying attention? I now have some questions for you. So we're going to find out. Um, if you are watching this video by yourself, uh, you might just think about these questions naturally as I pose them to you. Um, if you are um, maybe a little bit more curious about these questions, feel free to pause the video, think about them. If you are watching this video as a class and if you are watching it as a class, that's wonderful. Um, but yeah, it's strange to think that so many of you will have to put up with my accent. Anyway, um, yeah, if uh, you are watching this as a class, who knows, maybe your teacher might want to pause when I pose each question and you can have a little bit of a discussion. So I've got four questions for you regarding Criterion A. The first one, is you've read that your text in class, how else can you revisit them in your own time? Number two, what are some of the main features that we need to remember about our text? Oh, you nearly saw number four there. Uh, three, what are some of the main features? I just, I've already said that, haven't I? I've already said that. Number three, what are some of the essential quotes in the text that you have studied? And four, what critical theories could you apply in your chosen text? Right, criterion B. For criterion B, we need to make sure that we are conducting analysis and also evaluation. Um, this is crucial. We might neglect this, 
but it's important that we don't. Remember that criterion A and criterion B are worth 10 marks each. C and D only five marks each. So the stakes are higher in paper two. If you don't conduct analysis and evaluation, you're really not going to get a good mark in this exam. Um, this is what I want to offer you today. One, make sure you can remember some authorial choices in your text. Two, please make sure that you write a lot about a little. Three, make sure you are comparing and contrasting the use of the techniques that you identify. And four, offer some evaluation. Don't forget the evaluation. Let's delve into this further. So let's not complain about it. Um, we are going to have to analyse and evaluate authorial choices in the exam. And certainly at the time of making this video, the paper two examination is a closed book exam. Um, so you're not going to be able to refer to the book when you analyse your choices. Um, this is hard uh, because, as I said earlier, it's quite difficult for you to remember uh, big quotes. With that in mind, I would encourage you to think about some other easy to remember or for your choices that you can talk about instead of talking about long quotes. Just think about the openings of the text that you have read. Um, for instance, think about um, something like, uh, let's say, Pride and Prejudice uh, with that famous opening line. Another famous opening line is in 1984. Um, if you've read books like that, then surely there's something you can remember from the opening that you can talk about in detail. Uh, think about the endings. Um, I'm currently reading A Doll's House with my students. The final line of the play is a wonderful thing um, and that's easy to remember. So you could analyse that. What does that quote mean? Uh, you might want to think about key descriptions. So if you're doing something like of mice and men, think about the description of Curly's wife or Curly's, um, sorry, uh, Crux's room. Think about key speeches and dialogues. If you're doing Macbeth, I'm sure you can remember um, the, um, is this a dagger speech? Think about key moments of conflict and tension. Are there any moments where two characters seem to be contrasted with one another? Maybe they are even juxtaposed with one another. Um, and also think about symbols and motifs. Um, so not that you'd probably be doing this for um, IB English A, but if you're doing something like um, the Hunger Games, uh, what does the uh, Mockingjay perhaps represent? Um, so these are all things that you could remember quite easily and then talk about in your examination. Um, whatever it is that you choose to write about, I urge you to write a lot about a little. So whether it be one of those easy things I've just mentioned or a quote that you happened to remember, make sure you go into detail when analysing that authorial choice. You may want to dissect and zoom in. You may want to keep asking yourself questions like how, 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 why, why, why. You might want to think about the effect. What does it make the reader think? And the impact, how does it make the reader feel? Then, when you are conducting your analysis, it's really important that you are 
comparing and contrasting the use of different techniques by the different authors that you are dealing with. And this is what makes the paper two criterion B different from criterion B for the other English A assessments. You need to compare and contrast techniques. This is difficult. Uh, I'm going to try and explain one way in which you can perhaps do this. Uh, I'm sure we are all familiar with point evidence explanation, P. Um, so on the screen now you have two P paragraphs, uh, one about the love story in Wuthering Heights, one about the love story in Romeo and Juliet. If I am uh, moving too fast for you, feel free to pause and read these at your own leisure. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is that you have two separate isolated P paragraphs. Nice ideas, um, but it's not useful in terms of comparison. If we want to compare, we might merge these two P paragraphs together. Uh, and I will read this out for you. Bronte and Shakespeare both employ time in a way that helps convey particular messages about the love stories at the heart of their narratives. For example, Bronte chooses to start the story when the characters are children. By seeing the characters grow up together, we feel greater attachment towards the characters and the love that bind them together. In Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare indicates that Romeo and Juliet have only known each other for a few days. This suggests that they have rushed into their relationship and their decision to die for each other is not romantic, but actually quite naive. Hopefully, what you can identify there is P-E-E-E-E, -E -E -E, point, evidence, explanation, evidence, explanation. That is one way of writing a comparative paragraph. There are other ways that you could explore. I'm sure your teacher has got ideas, but that is one method I would like to share with you for now. Uh, by the way, before I move on, um, this paragraph is just for illustrative purposes. It's not the best paragraph. I'm sure you could do a much better job in your examination. Um, and finally, for criterion B, let's talk about, about evaluation. Because remember, it's not just analysis, it's analysis and evaluation. If you have watched my video about paper one, I make the point that you can evaluate by asking yourself questions like the questions that I have now displayed on the screen. Uh, but for paper two, there might be another question that you could ask yourself. Think about it a little bit like a fight. Which text is better? Uh, which text does a better job at achieving its desired effect? Which text uses its authorial choices in the most successful way? Uh, so you might want to think about it as a battle as well and weigh up the pros, the pros and cons for each side and ultimately um, say which side you think is the best and why. Uh, that is one method for um, incorporating evaluation into your paper too. Criterion B, questions. Number one. What are some of the easy to remember authorial choices in the text that you have studied? Number two, describe one method for extending your analysis. Oh dear. Um, what is a P-E-E-E-E -E 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 paragraph? And last one for this section, give an example of a question that we can ask ourselves when trying to evaluate. We're doing well, we're making good time, and um, I'm so glad that you've um, kept up 
with me. Um, I know that I need to buy a microphone, uh, so I apologise uh, for that. Uh, but thank you for staying with me so far. It's much appreciated. Uh, okay, Criterion C. Um, right, um, four things to remember here about focus and organisation. A. No, that's confusing, isn't it? Because it's Criterion A, B, C and D. One. Please remember to focus on the prompt. Two. Be aware of the different overall structures that you can use in your comparative essay. Three, make sure you include good introductions and conclusions. And finally, four, make sure you are including connectors to enhance your cohesion. In particular, make sure you are using connectors for comparison. Let's go. To make sure that our work is adequately focused, we must make sure that we are focusing on the prompt. Um, I would strongly advise you to read your prompt carefully, break it down, deconstruct it, and make sure you know exactly what the prompt is asking you to do. So I have included some examples here referring to two of the works you have studied. Remember, it's two, not three, not four, not five. Discuss how, both how and why. So how and why. The text invites the reader to identify with situations, characters and or ideas. So you have some topics there that you need to explore. The second one, how is home depicted in two of the works you have studied? Again, it's two. And what is its significance? Again, it's asking you to do two things. How is home depicted? And what is its significance? In a question like this, you've got the concept of home. And in a lot of the paper two questions, there are certain concepts or certain theories or certain statements included. Um, I would invite you to spend some time dwelling on what those concepts actually mean and maybe make light of that in your introduction. Maybe you could treat it a little bit like your TOK essay where you have to break down the question and provide definitions in your introduction. In this case, what do we mean by home? Because that surely is going to have implications for what you say elsewhere in your response. Make sure you know the possible structures that you can use in your paper too. I've got two possible structures here for you, structure A and structure B. I would say structure A is a bit easier uh, and Maybe this is better for students who are just trying to play it safe. Uh, you might have an introduction, you might have a paragraph, a section about text one, a paragraph, a section about text two. You then might have some kind of section where you are comparing and contrasting the two texts, and then you have a conclusion. I would much rather see students use structure B. I think the most advanced students uh, should be able to challenge themselves with this kind of structure. Here we have an introduction, then we have one section where we compare and contrast text one and two together, um, and then we have subsequent paragraph sections where we do the same thing. Um, I've done it three times here. Um, it could be two times, it could be four times. Um, that ultimately depends on the prompt and what ideas you can come up with. Uh, obviously end with a conclusion. And on that note, think about your overall introductions and conclusions. Um, try your best to keep them short and, and sweet, whilst also performing the jobs that you need to do when it comes to your introduction and conclusion. 
I've got some examples that I have for you here. Um, writers often use names of characters and places to convey not only literal meaning, but also implicit meaning too. It is this implicit meaning that will be the focus of this essay. This essay will show how character names contribute to characterization in Death of a Salesman and place names add to the atmosphere in Jane Eyre. Uh, what I've done in the first sentence is I have used words from a particular prompt. Um, I have then uh, basically said what it is I intend to do um, in the rest of my essay. Uh, and I think I've made those points quite clear. The model uh, conclusion that you can see below just sums up retrospectively what I imagine I would have written in the middle. Uh, in conclusion, this essay has shown that character names, especially the name of Lohman, helps the reader to better understand the characters in Death of a Salesman. In addition, place names like Lowood are used in Jane Eyre to help depict a certain atmosphere. Um, so I've just summed up what the points I've made in the essay. Uh, I've added something a little extra here though. I've I've added a little bit of evaluation. On the whole, it could be said that Jane Eyre is the most effective when it comes to using names in this way. Um, I wouldn't just throw that at the end. Maybe it's something that I have touched on earlier on in the essay, but a conclusion is a good opportunity to um, include some evaluation, explicit evaluation. Um, if you watch my video about paper one, you'll also see that I mention things about mini introductions and mini conclusions. That's also useful. You might want to check it out. Uh, finally, for criterion C, let's talk about connectives. Each paragraph should start with a connective. You should be using connectives throughout your work to maintain cohesion. Obviously, for paper two, we're going to have to include a lot of comparison connectives. So you can see some here, I've circled them for you. Um, and I have some extra ones here as well. Make sure you are familiar with these connectives uh, and you are competent when it comes to including them in your work. Criterion C, questions, let's get into it. Um, number one, why is it important to break down the guiding question? It's not really a guiding question, it's more of a prompt, isn't it? Uh, anyway, number two, uh, what are the pros and cons of the two essay structures proposed in this video? If you can't remember what they are, uh, go back and find out. Three. What are some tips for writing effective paper two introductions and conclusions? And four, a bit of a big one, list three connectives that can be used when writing about similarities and three that can be used when writing about differences. Because remember, those connective, comparative connectives are vital. The final leg now, criterion D, um, language, this is how you write, how successfully you write. Um, four things to remember, one, please proofread, two, include advanced vocabulary, three, include advanced punctuation, and four, aim for a lucid, mature, sophisticated, expert-like register tone voice. Let's go deeper. All of this is quite similar to what I said in my paper one video, but it just goes to show how all of this is fundamental to what we do as language and literature students. The first thing I would like to say is that you should proofread your work to avoid mistakes surrounding accuracy, spelling and grammar. Some people might say that they forget to proofread their work. No one should be forgetting to proofread their work. 
Uh, my personal approach to proofreading is that I proofread at the end of every sentence. I then proofread at the end of every paragraph and I then proofread at the end of the entire essay. So I'm constantly proofreading throughout. In terms of language, I think we should aim to include advanced vocabulary as well. Um, you might just have some advanced vocabulary in your arsenal that you can use, uh, which makes you sound impressive. Uh, but you could also include literary specific vocabulary. For example, things like buildings, Roman, mise-en-scene, omniscient, narrator. Um, these terms relate to what we are studying, but in themselves, they are also quite advanced. You might even include technical vocabulary in regards to the writer's craft, things like different language devices, for instance. Um, and you might include vocabulary related to advanced ideas. Um, I talked in the Criterion A section about literary theory. There might be some advanced terms related to advanced literary theory ideas that you can include. I would encourage you to include advanced punctuation as well. This is not a requirement according to the IB, but I do think it, it will impress the examiner if you can use advanced punctuation correctly. Um, I love seeing colons used correctly. I love seeing semicolons used correctly. Um, even just to make sure you get in some brackets as well. Um, that in itself can be impressive. Um, ultimately, we need to be aiming for a um, strong voice in our work. You are getting marked on your register, your tone. Um, I would avoid referring to the writer by their first name. So don't say William, say Shakespeare or William Shakespeare or the writer, the playwright. Don't ever say William, he's not your friend. Avoid using digits for numbers that can be easily written. So don't say Shakespeare uses three metaphors and use the number three. Um, you could quite easily write T-H-R-E-E, -E, spell it out. If you don't spell out a short word like that, it looks incredibly lazy. Avoid informal language, slang uh, connected to that. Avoid contractions like don't, won't, shouldn't, because all of those could be deemed quite informal. And avoid rhetorical questions. Um, look, a lot of this might, might be subjective. These may be on my personal preferences. Um, whatever we do, whatever we decide to do, uh, we just need to make sure that we strive for a lucid, mature, sophisticated tone voice register in our work. And I think by avoiding some of the things I've mentioned, you can work towards that tone register voice. Um, overall, what we want to do is come across as an expert. And it's the final set of questions. Um, Unfortunately, I dropped these questions a moment ago, so I'm just putting them back into the right order. Here we go. You might have seen these questions if you watch my paper one video, but it's good to recap. Uh, number one, uh, what can we do to make sure that we don't forget to proofread our work? Number two, provide one type of advanced vocabulary that we can include in our work. Number three, what are the rules for using semicolons and colons? And the last one, what kind of voice register tone should we be aiming for in our essay? That's it, all done. Um, so I hope that has been useful to you. Uh, Thank you so much for tuning in. If you liked what you saw, 
please like and subscribe. I always appreciate it. Um, but look, the main aim here is for you to do well in your paper two examination. I'm sure you will be brilliant. So good luck. Go and knock their socks off. You're going to do an excellent job. Take care. Goodbye.